All righty. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lathia Church. If you would, let's stand and worship our God. we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you as a church, to congregate together, and to lift up you who is worthy of all praise. 
Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 135, 13 through 18. It says, your name, Lord, endures forever. It says, your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not hear. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. For those who make them become like them, and so do all who trust him. Father God, as we're worshiping this morning, would you help us identify these idols that we set in our lives? these things that we give control, that we give power. They do not have ears to hear. They do not have eyes to see. They do not care about our well-being. But you do. But not only do you care, you are capable. You are wonderful. You are glorious. And that means that anything we bring to you, you can resolve. You can heal. Because you are a wonderful, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So God, as we sing together as a church, Help us to put all distractions aside and focus on just bringing glory, singing worship to your name and no other name. Let's sing this together. Only a holy God.
God, would you center us this morning? That we would seek nothing else but you. I just want to sit 
here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave No, I'm not here for blessings It's Jesus you don't know me anything and more than anything that you can do I just want you God would you captivate us this morning God, that when we wake up, when we see your creation, would it be a living testimony to who you are, our great and glorious creator. God, as we enter into worship, as we enter a time of prayer and petition, as we listen to your word, help us to put our idols aside to focus solely on you. We need to be reminded of that every day because there are so many distractions. There are so many things in this world competing for our attention, but you are the only one who is worthy of it. God, these lyrics that we're singing, let it not just pass through us but remain integrated into our walk, into our truth. That we don't want anything else but you. That we desire for you and you alone to be our focus, to be our vision, to be our goal, to be our will. I pray this all in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's hear this reading of the Word of God. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 14 through 22. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? that food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord of jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we get this morning to just worship you and learn more about you. And God, I pray that you would be with each and every one of us, that you would calm our hearts and that you would open them to receive what Kevin has to say today, Lord. I pray that you would speak through him and that uh, we would be reminded of your glory and we just thank you for Jesus Lord we thank you that you brought him here to die for us and we pray that we would continue to honor you through all I pray all this in Jesus name amen you may grab a seat good morning welcome to Aletheia Church uh, my name is Kevin I'm one of the pastors here thanks for coming and thawing out with us this morning um, if you are unaware because you don't check the news, it is going to be even colder tonight, so please mentally prepare yourself, uh, especially if you are a student. 
uh, trying to get to class tomorrow, bu bundle up. Um, adults and Floridians, there will be likely be something on your windshield known as frost tomorrow morning. So you'll need to start your car early and, and defrost it. Uh, as a northerner, that is my advice to you because you likely don't have those little scrapers in your car because we live in Florida and it's not supposed to drop below 50 here. Um, this is the Lord's chastisement and punishment for us to us for some reason. Um, kids, uh, you are dismissed to go with the teachers to Alethea Jr. and enjoy your lesson with them this morning. Um, if this is your first Sunday with us or you have not grabbed one yet uh, and would like a scripture journal, just raise your hand. We'll give that to you. That's our free gift to you. Uh, we are studying the book of 1 Corinthians together. So if you would like one of those, just raise your hand and we will make sure that someone passes one of those out. And while we pass those out or while you're turning over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in your Bible, uh, let me share a little story with you. Um, there's, a, there's a famous story in my family when I was a kid. Uh, we had just gotten our first minivan. And my mom was putting uh, my sister and myself in the car, and she slammed her head as she was getting out really, really hard on the frame of the sliding door of the van. And she was, you know, in tears, you know, kind of probably had a concussion and was kind of sitting there. And my dad comes out and is like, honey, what, like, what is wrong? Like, like what happened? And so my mom proceeds to begin to explain what she had done, and she walks over to the van, and she kind of explains, like, I was in here, and I was putting Kristen in her car seat, and, I, right, and as I was coming out, I slammed my head on the frame of the, on the van. And she did it again just as hard as she had done it before. So at this point, she's, like, seeing double and triple. The trip is canceled. No one's going anywhere. My dad gets us out of the car. And, and you know, it's a funny story looking back on it as a family. Uh, we laugh about it, and my dad's like, yeah, that was really dumb. And, but in the moment, obviously, it was terrible. And as I was reading our text this week, that story and, and this famous line by a guy by the name of George Santayana, he's a Harvard professor, I am confident that most of you have heard this line before. Those that do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. How many of you guys have heard that line before? Yeah, about half of you. The rest of you guys hate history, like my wife, right? And the point behind that was is if we don't learn from mistakes and things that happened in the past or things that we did well and, 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 and use those things in the future, we're doomed to repeat the mistakes that we've made in the past if we don't learn from it. And he gets credit for saying that, but the reality is, is it's not as if this Harvard professor in the mid-1900s discovered something that the rest of human history had never observed before in the course of our existence. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul actually presents a similar idea in our text this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And he's going to propose to the church at Corinth, especially those who had been exercising and flaunting these freedoms that we had talked about in chapters 8 and chapters 9, um, he's going to propose to them that exercising their freedom so openly, flaunting them so willingly, was going to present to them the risk of being ignorant to imminent dangers that participation in these freedoms might bring. Specifically, the dangers that would come without taking caution that these freedoms might eventually lead to some form of idolatry. And he's going to do this kind of by making two main points in our text this morning that we really need to pay attention to and take seriously if we're professing followers of Jesus to make sure that we're reflecting and, and, and working through these things. So the first one is this. He's going to warn the Corinthians against complacency. And, and not taking their day-to-day -day life seriously, not taking the reality of what they're participating in seriously. And then he's going to urge them to flee idolatry on the back end of that. So let's look at the text and start breaking this down. Looking at these first five verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he's going to start out by unveiling to them Israel's complacency at one point in time in the history of Israel. Look at, the, look at the text with me, starting in verse 1. 
He says, for I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, this is one of those really, really fun passages that if you don't take your time to process through it, you're going to either read through it and ignore everything that, that Paul is saying here because it's borderline confusing, or you're going to overthink it and you're not going to draw the application correctly from the context of what Paul has been talking about previously in this letter to the church at Corinth. So when you get to, to verse one there, that first word for is meant to be a bridge of connection of ideas of what Paul has been talking about previously in chapters eight and nine. And so what he's doing is he's saying, hey, everything I'm about to explain to you in chapter 10 is a continuation of what I was arguing or the point I was making previously in chapters 8 and 9. And we spent a, a, a lot of time in that in the last couple weeks, right? But just remember what he was talking about there. He was talking about the, the, the issue going on inside of Corinth was this refusal of some to lay down their rights, lay down their preferences, lay down their freedoms for the sake of those around them and for the sake of the witness to the good news of what Jesus had done. Paul had made this point in a number of different ways throughout these two chapters, but his main idea was we should be so gripped by the reality of what Christ has done for us that laying down our freedoms, laying down our rights, laying down our preferences should seem like nothing in comparison to being able to love on people and share with them the good news of what Jesus has done in your life. And there's all sorts of applications to that. I've heard a lot of good things coming out of our gospel communities the last couple of weeks about us kind of processing through that as a church and thinking through that as a church. But there's all sorts of things that we can apply that to in 2022. But in the particular issue going on inside of the church at Corinth was whether they could eat meat that had been sacrificed previously to idols or even for some of them actually going into the idol temple itself and eating the meat there. That the, the thought process was, well, we're so free in Christ that we can just go in there. There's no such thing as these false gods. We're not worried about it. We, we, don't, we don't need to be worried about it. We don't need to be bound to this. And so Paul moves into chapter 10 after encouraging us to lay down our freedoms, lay down our rights, lay down all of these things that we, that we are free in theologically for the sake of the gospel. And when we get to chapter 10, he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. Well, unaware of what? Right? Because he's already made the theological argument. He's already made the, the point that we should be willing to lay down from a practice standpoint these freedoms that we have. Then, then what could they possibly be unaware of? And he's going to show them through Israel's example that the way they're living inside of these freedoms, the way they're exercising them, and the way that they are living amongst one another is they're running the risk of falling into the same traps of idolatry that Israel fell into once they entered the wilderness after the exile in Egypt. Right? Look at what he says. He says, Israel is an example to us. Israel was under the cloud. They were baptized into the cloud, and they drank from the rock. Right? He's drawing comparisons between the baptism of the Israelites as they passed through the Red Sea, as they passed in front of the cloud, as the, the cloud uh, of, the, uh, of the angel of the Lord, right, protected them from the Egyptians as he led them out of Egypt, right? What Paul is saying is there are comparisons between that baptism that the nation of Israel experienced as God delivered them and sent them into uh, the promised land to the baptism that Christians experience when they are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ Jesus, right? He's saying basically... 
The spiritual heritage of Israel is your spiritual heritage to the church at Corinth. You may not have Jewish blood flowing through your veins. You may not have somewhere in your family tree where your family is culturally Jewish. But you are a part of God's people if you are in Christ. And therefore, look to their example and what they had experienced. They experienced deliverance from an oppressor in Egypt, much the same way we were delivered from the oppression of sin and death and Satan, that God has delivered us the same way he has delivered the Israelites. He goes on to say that all of them ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. What he's referring to there is the manna and the water that God provided in the wilderness to Israel can be compared to when we take communion and partake in the bread and the wine, recognizing our need for sustenance from the Lord, that this same way that God has provided for us in Christ, he provided to Israel in the wilderness. And then he says in verse 4, in case anyone's not tracking, Jesus is the rock. Right? Jesus was the one who led Israel, not Moses, Israel out of Egypt, protected them, provided for them, and led them into the promised land the same way he has rescued us and delivered us from sin and death reconciling us to the Father, our Creator. And so he makes this sweeping statement that Israel and the Gentile believers in Corinth are of the same family and spiritual limit, uh, lineage. And then he's going to say this. Let's look at Israel's history. Let's look at their story in the wilderness as our brothers and sisters, and learn from their example on what to do and what not to do. Because we have much to learn from them. And he's going to share a lot this morning on what not to do, right? Look at what he says in verse 5. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now I want to take us take a second here, and I want us just to pause and reflect on this a second. Right? Because I think Paul is making a very, very big point to a lot of the leaders that were in the church at Corinth. And I think there are a lot of parallels on things we personally. Right, if we profess to be a follower of Jesus in here this morning, need to take seriously as well as we examine this. He said, he's saying to them, church, listen, listen up for a second. All of Israel, when they were in the wilderness, had experienced God's blessing. They had experienced his deliverance. They had experienced his faithfulness. Time and time again, they experienced his provision and love for them. They had seen his miracles and his works time and time again. And yet, despite that testimony, despite their experience and their witness to what God was doing in and among them, God was not pleased with them. Guys, this is a warning to all of us that proximity to God's faithfulness does not ensure that we are in Christ. That proximity to being involved with the work of God and what God does, is doing in and around us does not guarantee that we will finish the race. That many in Israel did not finish the race. If the race and the entry into blessing was entering into the promised land, an entire generation was left wandering in the desert until they had all passed away, finally ending with Moses before God allowed his covenant people to enter into the rest that he had provided. 
Participation in baptism, participation in communion, participation in church or your campus ministry or a Bible study or all the trappings and the things that we say and do, all of which, by the way, are good things, does not guarantee perseverance and salvation does not guarantee that we will experience the joy of obedience in Christ. To maybe put this another way, and and I think with our particular tribe and and what we tend to emphasize as a church, right? we, we highly emphasize the word of God and belief in him and trusting in his truth. I mean, the word aletheia is the Greek word for truth. So if anyone ever asks you, what is that? Truth Church, that's the name of our church. We just, tra- we just hit it in a Greek word. But in caring about those things, right, the danger we run into is forgetting that proper theology does not guarantee faith-led obedience to God. And you will see throughout the New Testament, but especially... In James's letter, that faith without works is a dead faith. That mere mental assent to the gospel without heart change and response to God's proclamation on our lives, following him in obedience, is a dead faith. And, and, and before you walk away and say, well, Pastor Kevin's teaching a work-based salvation, No. That is not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that if you are truly in Christ, you will change. Your heart will be changed. Your desires will be changed. Your life will be changed. And if it's not, what I would submit to you this morning is that maybe you are running into the same dangers that Israel ran into in the wilderness the same dangers that some at the church in Corinth were running into and that many around us in the church run into, that we believe if we merely mentally agree with something, that we're good to go. And that faithfully walking with Jesus is so much more than that. What Paul is going to be saying here to the church at Corinth is that I fear many of you are complacent and unaware of the dangers of falling into sin that lurk lurk around you constantly. Just as much of Israel was ignorant and unaware, we should see their story as a warning and an example that all of us, myself included, are far closer to falling away from the true freedom that is found in obedience to Jesus than we dare imagine. Guys, hear me, hear me on this this morning. The world is not our friend. Right? The world around us is centered around doing whatever it may do to pull you away from finding true freedom in Christ. And it is going to offer up to us all sorts of false gospels. Many of them, at the time, seemingly being for our good. Some of them will even masquerade as bringing glory to God when they do not. And Paul's warning to us this morning is to look at what happened in Israel to take that seriously and make sure that we are examining our own lives in light of true obedience to Christ because that is where true freedom is found. So he's going to give five warnings to the church based upon things that Israel struggled with in the wilderness starting in verse 6. Of chapter 10. Look at that with me. He says, Now these things took place as an example for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Right? So there's the first one. Right? What was what was the issue in Israel where they desired evil above 
worshiping God. And Paul is referring to when Israel was in the wilderness, they were hungry, they were tired of the manna that had been provided for them. And what happened was, is they desired life in Egypt over the deliverance that God had promised them in the promised land. Look at Numbers chapter 11, verses four through six with me. It says, now the rabble, not great if you find yourself in the Bible being described amongst that group, was among them, had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Right, ultimately, what Israel is saying there and those that are part of this group that is so frustrated is they're saying, we choose slavery to Egypt over freedom and deliverance from God. We would rather have the good tasting food of this world rather than the needed provision that God is providing us as he delivers us into the promised land. Right, because it seems subtle. Like, I like meat. Meat's good. Really glad that post-Jesus, there's even more eat that, meat that we could eat than before. Bacon, yes and amen. But what is being displayed here is much more than, than just wanting this food that they had had in Egypt. What they're saying is, is, I would rather be enslaved to the world than be free in God. They desired the world and what the world could offer over their God and their creator. And Paul says, look at their example. Look at what happened to them. They got into the wilderness. Things were tough. God was providing, but it wasn't enough for them. They desired more. And look at what happened. And he says this in verse 7. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. We must not, excuse me, they sat down to eat, and drink, and rose up to play. Let's stop there. Right, the second warning, do not be idolaters. Paul is referring to when Israel had Aaron create the golden calf when Moses was up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. If you guys are familiar with that story, it didn't take long, right? Like the chapter previously, they're like, we'll worship God no matter what. Aaron, like the chief priest, by the way, total wuss. No backbone whatsoever. His, his brother Moses heads up on the mountain and the people are like, he's gone. Let's find a new God to worship. Aaron immediately folds under the pressure. Yeah, just give me all your gold. I'll make you a new God because that's how that happens, apparently. Right? And he fashions it into a golden calf. And if you get to Exodus chapter 32, verse 6, look at what it says. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. They offered sacrifices to this false God. They ate and they drank and they worshiped him and they played. Like the new God is here. We did it. Moses is gone, but it's okay. We made a new one. Even though we watched God, you know, separate an entire body of water previously, not as good as the cow. And Paul says that so often right, we run this risk of running into idolatry the way that Israel did. Now, this would have been pretty simple for the Corinthians to understand because there were so many idol temples around Corinth. And so they're going to know exactly what Paul's talking about. But in, in our day and age, right, idolatry is something that's a little bit harder for us to grasp, right? Because there's likely not a temple to Artemis right off of campus, right? You don't pass the temple to Poseidon on your way to church on Sunday morning. This tends to be less of a problem. But idolatry is actually not necessarily associated with graven images or statues. Right? As a matter of fact, 
The New City Catechism, which I, which I do with my, my sons, right, asks this question, what is idolatry? And the answer is idolatry is trusting in created things rather than the creator. Idolatry is trusting in created things rather than the creator. Meaning that biblical idolatry does not have to be us worshiping a statue of some creature or some animal. That idolatry comes in all forms of worship that many of us are tempted to participate in every single day. Worshiping money. Relationships. Sex. Power, control, entertainment, our phones, our computers, and maybe one of the biggest ones that I see regularly in our own culture, identity. You worship your own identity and what you believe it to be over the one that you have been given in your creator. You know, John Calvin once said, man's nature, so to speak, is a perpetual factory of idols. Like no one ever needs to teach a young child to worship the creation rather than the creator. Any parent in here knows exactly what I'm talking about. Your, your child is born and you see it almost immediately. Right? And then we spend our lives after that running after these things trying to fill a God-sized hole in our heart with the things that God created. And what Paul is calling out to in the church at Corinth here is saying to them, look, we are called to be on the lookout for our propensity to fall into this sort of idolatry, be looking out for it constantly. And my fear for many of us is that we don't take this warning seriously enough. We don't examine how we spend our time. We don't examine how we live our lives. We don't examine what our heart and our affections are for, for. And what we fail to realize is that oftentimes we are participating in fellowship with an idol. And as we're going to see here in a minute, minute, that inevitably breaks fellowship with the Lord every time. Because God is a jealous God. The third warning he gives them in verse 8. He warns them against... Sexual immorality. Right, look at what he says. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. I don't have time to go to that story, but if you want to write this down, Numbers chapter 25 is where that story is located. What had happened was is that the Israelites had moved into the wilderness and they had gotten involved with some of the nation groups nearby. And they participated in a fertility cult. That they were around. And these fertility cults believed that if you participated in religious prostitution and orgies, that the gods would bring health and fertility and prosperity to you. And so God had warned them multiple times not to worship the gods, not to intermingle with the people that worship false gods, to not get involved with these things. And yet Israel consistently chose to do whatever the heck they wanted to do anyway. And so they did that. And 23,000 of them died that day because of their idolatry, their disobedience, and their sin. E Israel's openness to the culture around them, despite God's frequent warnings against this, led to this judgment being pronounced upon them. Resonate at all? As I've said multiple times, right, we are byproducts of the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s. Right? Not that far from what these fertility cults believed, guys. Are we being shaped by God and his word, are we being shaped by the culture around us? Fourth warning, verse 9. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Right? It seems kind of crazy to think like they put Jesus to the test, but Paul's made it abundantly clear that Jesus was the one with them in the wilderness. Right? And this story is found in Numbers chapter 21. Once again, the people were complaining about the food, complaining about the manna, complaining about not having anything to drink, and ultimately they complained against God. And so God just sends a bunch of serpents to start killing the Israelites. 
don't know exactly how this showed. I don't know if the serpents just rolled into the camp and started going into the tents and tents and biting people. But people start dying. And the, and the, story, the way the story goes is the people immediately run to Moses and are like, all right, our bad. De- definitely our bad. Will you please go to God and ask him to stop? Th- this is our bad, right? And Moses goes to the Lord and, and, and asks for God to forgive them. And, and God is merciful. If you, if you don't learn anything from the story of, of Israel and Exodus and Numbers, you see God's mercy over and over and over again to his people, even though they are stubborn, obstinate, and idol worshipers. But their example to us is they put God to the test, and God disciplined them. Then the fifth warning, verse 10, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. This is found in Exodus chapter 16. They're once again complaining about food, not having enough, not having what they need, having to wander in the wilderness. And what ends up happening is the destroyer should be viewed as the angel who had executed God's judgment at the Passover in Exodus chapter 12. And, and that, that basically what uh, Paul is saying here is, is God brought judgment on these people and the angel of death visited some of them. And ultimately, Paul is basically trying to unveil this to the church at Corinth, these people he's been pouring so much into. He's trying to unveil to us that Israel's issues with idolatry and falling away are an example to us so that we might not do the same. Learn from their mistakes, learn from their failures, learn from their propensity to not trust in the Lord. Because as he says, In verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, because of their example, because of what we've just learned, because we've just learned that this is our heart's propensity to fall into this type of failing, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Let me translate that for you. Do not be overly confident in yourself or your ability to stand firm in the face of the world, the culture, and your own temptations around you. Or you may find yourself falling and failing as Israel did in the wilderness. He goes on to say, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. He says, look, these temptations are common to everyone. There's nothing you are experiencing in Corinth that's not common to anyone else. God is going to be faithful to you. But at times, and this is the real kicker guys, and this is something I want you to notice, right? Remember that Paul had told them they were free to participate in eating that meat from a theological standpoint, but that from a practical standpoint, he thought it was unwise for them to do so. And the point he's making to them here is not only is it right for them to surrender their freedoms for the sake of their brothers and sisters around them and the witness of the gospel, but it's also wise for them to abstain for their, for their own souls, He's saying, at times there is wisdom in choosing to abstain from freedoms because you likely cannot trust yourself to obey God and withstand temptation otherwise. This should be obvious. How many of you guys are on social media? Okay, a good majority of you. How many of you guys have ever logged into your social media account and seen people arguing over something on social media? Every hand should go up here, by the way. How many of you guys are tempted to be drawn into a pointless argument on social media? Okay, a few of you are honest. Okay, for those of you that didn't raise your hand, right? How many of you are tempted to gossip or become angry at reading all the comments in the argument that you read on social media? There, the remaining hands went up, right? Here, here is what I would submit to you, right? And this isn't me telling you to deactivate your social media account. That's not my place. But if we're using this as an example, right, walking into that territory and being in that place, there are very, very few options for you in that place to not sin. Very few. 
very difficult to not become judgmental, to not gossip, to not be engaged in a fight that is worthless. Very, very difficult to wait in that space and exercise your freedom to be there and make much of Jesus while you do it. And this is Paul's whole point to the Corinthians. Hey, you, we need to do the hard work of examining the situations, the environments, and the places that we put ourselves because very, very rarely are we wise enough to be able to trust ourselves to live well to the glory of God in those situations. And then look at what he says in verse 14, right? Because you would be looking for at this point, right? All right, Paul, I hear you. I agree with you. This is not good. So what's, what's the option? What should we be doing then at this point? Look at what he says in verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Notice he doesn't say stand firm. He doesn't tell them to learn a bunch of stuff so that they can withstand the test. Notice he doesn't tell them to work out and become stronger. Like nothing listed there. Right? He looks at us and he says, run. Run. Run from the temptation. He says that we're apt to think that we can knuckle down and, and power through and still remain loyal and be obedient. And he says what we actually need to do is follow the example of Joseph when tempted by Potiphar's wife to sleep with her, to run out the room even if it means we're naked in the streets. Because this is an issue of our very fellowship with Jesus. So look at what he says. I speak as to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless is not a participation, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? He's like, hey, Israel was participating in fellowship with God. Is not what we do as a church when we take communion and we gather together and we sing songs and we worship and, and declare Jesus and his victory over sin and death and that we are hidden in Christ? Are we not in fellowship with him? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything other than is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. He's like, look, listen, you run the risk of breaking fellowship with your king and your savior by running into these things. That we as followers have a a level of fellowship and closeness with God that had never been there before. And we participate in that through communion and prayer and Bible reading and fellowship with other believers and worship. And in the same way that, that those in Corinth ran the risk by going into a temple and eating the food sacrificed there, that they run the risk of participating in fellowship with a demon, we do the same, just maybe not in a temple. Maybe it's on our computer. Maybe it's in front of our phone. Maybe it's at a restaurant. Where we run the same risk of idolatry. As he says in verse 22, shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And guys, when, when, when scripture talks about God being jealous, it's not your type of jealousy, right? Like we, we all know that jealous person, they're not a ton of fun to be around, right? When, when, the, when scripture talks about God being jealous, he mean, it means he's jealous for you. It means he's jealous of his glory. You might say, well, that sounds pretty pretentious. Well, he's the God of the universe, right? It's not jealousy, and pretentiousness if he's actually worthy of the praise and honor he's looking for. It's jealousy and pretentious and narcissism for us to do that because guess what? You're a man or a woman. You are not God. 
you are not worthy of all glory and honor and praise and worship. And therefore, when you act and live your life in such a way to demand that of other people, people call you a narcissist because that's what you are. Because you're not the God of the universe. But if God is really God, it's not narcissism. He's actually worthy of that. You know, he created you. He spoke the universe into existence. Anybody here done that? Didn't think so. Right? It's, a, it's a type of jealousy that's rooted in reality as opposed to narcissism. And here's the beauty of your creator. When it says he's jealous, he's jealous for his glory, but he's also jealous for your good. And guess what your good is? Knowing him, being found in him, knowing why you're here, worshiping him, enjoying him, experiencing freedom from sin and victory over sin and death. He's jealous for that stuff. It's almost as if, you know, as a parent, I understand this well. Because as a parent, you're constantly basically running interference on your kids from running after things that will bring them harm. And your kid thinks you're evil. Like, Dad, why wouldn't you let me dive into the freezing cold temperature on the frozen lake in Virginia when we're there at Thanksgiving? Well, because you'll get hypothermia and die. That's why. I, I'm sorry I robbed you of joy. I'm jealous over your life. I'm jealous for your good. Right? And so when we look at it and we look at our propensity to idol worship, we immediately blame God for trying to keep us from these things that we think are are, are good and he's robbing us of joy. What he's actually doing is saving us from ourselves. And so as we process through this and as Paul calls all this out, right, there's even this, this part of this dark area of my heart that the Lord is still working on where I read this and I'm like, man, God wants to like rob me of having a good time. No, your good times are actually self-destructive. And God is here to rescue you from yourself. And so Paul calls out to them. He says, idolatry is dangerous. It destroys fellowship with God. And if you are a younger believer here, find an older believer and ask them if they've ever found a season where they were trapped in a cycle of sin and rebellion and what that did to fellowship with God. I promise you this, their testimony will not be, yeah, it, it, it strengthened it. It was good. It's a good decision to sin. It's awesome. Recommend it. I've been a believer now for over 16 years. I've never had one person ever come to me with a strong walk with the Lord and said, yeah, opening and, and, and living in open sin and rebellion towards God has worked out really well for me. It's gone well with me. God in his mercy sometimes rescues those men and women out of those seasons. But it has never once been something that those people and their testimony to me that they recommended. Never once. And yet God is merciful and patient and loving and gracious towards his people even when we fall into idolatry. But the call of God to us is to flee it before we ever fall into it. Church, this is a call to us this morning to take idolatry seriously. God is calling us not to be complacent about our lives. That following and walking with Jesus is so much more than just praying a prayer, coming down to the front of the church and making the altar call. No, it's a life of joyful devotion and obedience to him. And so you, you, you may need to leave here this morning asking yourself, are there things in my life that are causing me to risk fellowship with Jesus? What might those things be? Money, people, entertainment, self. Paul encourages us, us to not even entertain participation around those things because they may cause us to fall into idolatry. 
And if you're asking yourselves this question, you're like, I can already see it. I spend too much time on my phone. I'm addicted to social media. Paul's call to us, flee it. Don't entertain it. Don't try to defeat it. Don't try to stand firm. Don't try to overcome it. Run away from it. There was a young lady I knew a couple years ago who really struggled with, for lack of a better term, vanity, self-image, the way she, she looked. She was very centered on her appearance. And this, this led to a, a number of, of issues for her. Um, uncontrollable shopping. Um, and sadly, like it ultimately led into an eating disorder for her at some point. Um, which led to some health issues for her. And over time, through, through some counseling and through some really godly women and men in her life who loved on her and were like, hey, like, here's what we see in you. Here's what we're really worried about for you. Here's the freedom we think that Jesus is offering you and the freedom he's, he, he's giving to you. And we think you're, you're, you're not taking hold of that. And it breaks our heart. Jesus rescued her, guys. He did. But as I was thinking back on her story, she followed the advice that Paul gives here. She fled from the idolatry that she had fallen into. She deleted her Instagram account because it was a trigger for her to start questioning herself, to start questioning her worth, her identity. She got rid of her credit card so she couldn't shop on Amazon anymore. She deactivated her Amazon account. She got a, a fitness coach to actually help her create a meal plan for herself and to be disciplined and follow it to where there's like actual healthy eating practices going on. But she fled. And guys, her testimony today is a beautiful woman who is experiencing true freedom in Jesus. That's what Jesus wants for us. But he will not entertain sharing his glory with something that he created. And so we have to surrender it. And so here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to turn the lights down and we're going to have a time of, of reflection and response. And I want you to spend time in prayer reflecting on potential idols. And I want you to confess to God where you may be worshiping them. If you don't know, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal these things to you. If you're not a follower of Jesus here this morning, start with asking God to reveal himself to you. But ask God to show you where you may be worshiping some aspect of creation rather than him, and then ask God to forgive you. Let's spend a few moments in prayer doing just that.
and as followers of Christ. There's a couple of beautiful things that come from having sin and idolatry revealed to us. One, it's proof that the Holy Spirit is alive and active in our lives and veiling these things to us. We also have these things revealed to us in hope. Not because we look at our failings and, and the misery that lays before us, but we know that because we are in Christ, that when God looks at us, he doesn't see us, he doesn't see our sin, he doesn't see our failing, but that he sees Jesus' righteousness given to us. And so we're gonna take communion now we take communion here every week and we take communion as an act of worship to celebrate that, what, that whatever the Lord may have been laying on our hearts as we're thinking about idolatry and, and where we may be falling short, that God has promised to us in his son that he has forgiven us. And we know that on the, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus instituted right, the Lord's Supper Right, as, as an act of worship and remembrance of Christ giving his flesh and his body and his blood for us for the forgiveness of sin. And he says, starting in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may eat the wafer now, remembering that Christ gave his life for you for the forgiveness of sins. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may now drink the juice remembering that Christ's blood was poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church, we take communion not as an act of penance or contrition, but as an act of celebration because God has promised to us that we are forgiven and loved in Jesus. Let's take a moment to bow our heads. And will you pray and ask the Holy Spirit to empower you to flee in the coming days and weeks from the idols and instead of running to those idols to enjoy fellowship with him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its encouragement. Thank you for its example. Thank you for its instruction. Thank you for its exhortation. Or will you use this time convict us of idolatry and Lord will you encourage us Holy Spirit will you empower us to flee from that to flee from the false gospels from the, the false promises the false bill of goods that this world offers us knowing that no real life is found there and then God will you reveal yourself to us will you 
manifest to us the reality of who you are, your goodness, your mercy, your forgiveness, your love, your power, your freedom. And will you give us the strength to flee idolatry and instead run to you? To enjoy your presence, to enjoy your glory, to enjoy your people, and to worship you, knowing that that is for our good and your glory. God, will you do what you promised to do in us, and I ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to enter into a time of worship, and this next song that we're going to be singing is going to carry us through this act that we just had of communion. The song is Remembrance, and it's an opportunity for us to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Why do we take the elements? Why do we do this? So pay attention to the song and use it as an opportunity to reflect on the incredible work of Jesus Christ. So let's sing this together. Stay in worship. been 
Stand and sing, one God.
on every idol. towards us, even in those times where we are looking after other things, looking after the world. God, help us as we go out into our week to identify the idols that are holding us back from a genuine faith, from a true walk with you, God. We long to be with you. Reveal to us what separates us from your love. God, build in us a faith in this church, a new, renewed faith. Amen. I have a couple announcements for you guys as we uh, get ready to transition out. Um, my first announcement is uh, for any visitors. Uh, so if you're new to Aletheia, if this is your first time being here at the church, we would love to connect with you. We would love to get to know you. Uh, please go to the welcome desk, uh, which is right outside of the main doors, right outside of the glass doors. And there will be some people out there that will be uh, ready to greet you, get to know you, and get some information from you and to you so you can know more about the church. Second announcement is about our new uh, event emails. Uh, so what we're doing every week now is sending out a weekly email where we tell everyone what's going on at the church. As you can imagine, there's a lot of things going on right now. Uh, so the email goes out to everyone that is a regular attender or a member of Aletheia. Uh, so if you're not getting the emails, please let me know. Uh, we can make sure that uh, you change um, who you are in Planning Center uh, so that we can be able to get that out to you. Uh, so feel free just to connect with me as soon as church is over with. Next Sunday, we're going to have our member meeting, our first member meeting for 2022. Uh, so if you are a member, please come. If you want to become a member, that's a great time to join Aletheia Church. You can become a member at the member meeting next Sunday. It'll be about five minutes after church is over. We would love to see everyone in this room, um, as long as you live here, because some of you don't, don't, don't live here. I see you out there. Uh, if you live here in the city of Gainesville or in the surrounding area, please come and join that member meeting. We'd love to see you there. Wow, tough crowd. All right, it's okay. So um, men's retreat is this Friday and Saturday. So we're super excited about that. It'll be at Faith Baptist Church, uh, which is um, right down here. It's right around the corner. It's about a mile away. It's literally right next to the rock. Uh, Men's Retreat this Friday. If you haven't signed up, uh, you can scan the QR code. Uh, you can also, there we go. That's, that's all your beautiful faces. That's what I was looking for. Uh, so if you want to join, hopefully, all of those guys at Men's Retreat, uh, this was our Christmas party for the men this past um, Christmas. If you want to join all of us there, uh, we would love to see you guys at Men's Retreat. Again, see me. Uh, use the QR code. You can sign up in that way. Uh, you can also talk to Brent or talk to Stephen. A lot of people know a lot of information about Men's Retreat. Please come and join us. It'd be amazing. Next is Women's Retreat. So Women's Retreat is next month, which is almost here. Um, it's February the 18th and the 19th, Women's Retreat. If you want more information about Women's Retreat, you can do one of two things. You can scan the QR code uh, that's up on the screen. And or you can also talk to Kayla. Kayla's going to be in the collaboratory. Tough word. I'll say it again. 
She'll be in the collaboratory. Uh, so the collaboratory is where the food is, so right around the corner. She'll be in the collaboratory ready to answer any questions that you might have about women's retreat. I know the women would love to see you there. It's going to be a great time as well. Every fourth Friday, the women do this thing that I'm really jealous about. It's called Women's Night Out. And so the women get together at One Love Cafe. They hang out, fire, all that cool stuff. It'll be 28 de degrees. Tonight's going to be freezing cold. Uh, so it's a beautiful, beautiful night most of the time. You know, sometimes no fire. Last time we were there, right? No fire? It's okay. Hopefully tonight there'll be a fire. Uh, one, uh, one Love, sorry, not tonight, Friday. One Love Cafe. Uh, women would love to see you there. Uh, so uh, be sure to talk to Myra or Kayla about that as well. Um, and then the next announcement, I'm going to just throw back to Josh. Thank you. So the last announcement that we have is regarding worship. So we need a lot of help. And so if you're not serving in a particular ministry area and you're looking to serve somewhere, I'd love to steal you. Um, we need help with stagehands. We need help in the mornings. We need help with tech team, with lighting. The production for this space is a lot higher and a lot more demanding than it was in the previous space. So. It's pretty hectic in the morning, so the more help that we can get, the better. And if you're a musician with any instrument, come and talk to me because we like to plan for Easter and Christmas services as well. So please reach out. You can come to me directly. Directly, You can get contact information for me from any of our uh, pastors and elders. Um, but yes, please reach out. Thank you. Beautiful. So last announcement is about lunch spots. So lunch spots for today is Jimmy John's and Tijuana Flats. We would love to see you there. I'll pray for us, and we will be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together. God, I thank you for what communion means for us. Jesus, I thank you that you died for us to reconcile us to the Father. God, I pray that you would uh, remind us of your sacrifice, remind us of how precious your blood is. Turn our hearts away from idols, Lord. Allow us to lean into you and to love you the way that you love us. Jesus, we are so thankful for your grace. We pray that you would fill us with joy. Lord, help us to go and be the church today as we worship you. We ask all these things in the powerful name of Christ.